and whether Ronaldo could or could play with Guardiola's method, I'm not so sure. Is he fit enough to press from the front in the way that Guardiola wants to? I mean, he's obviously, he's physically in unbelievable nick. I mean, I'm not sitting here and saying Ronaldo's not fit enough when, yeah, I'm sitting here, not quite as fit as Ronaldo, but does he have the desire to, to play the way that Guardiola wants to play? Or does he represent, in a way, the antithesis of Guardiola's ego? that he thinks that the way that he wants to play is the way that you have to play and that he doesn't want someone like Ronaldo because I guess when Ronaldo was playing for Madrid and Guardiola was at Barcelona, Madrid were kind of about economy of effort and effectiveness and Barcelona were about flowery passing. Um, It just, you can see how it would be possible, but, and maybe Guardiola will get desperate, but it doesn't seem like Ronaldo is the kind of fit because also Guardiola likes choir boys. Yeah. He likes people that do what they're told. Yeah. And Ronaldo's, Ronaldo's been running a dressing room that's been managed by Zidane not that long ago. So, yeah, I, I, I think I'd be surprised. No, I, I would but, be surprised too. But I, I think he actually might be the thing if, if they're not going to get Harry Kane. Last question for you. Uh, on the 1st of September, where is Harry Kane playing football? Tottenham. Right. That will be interesting. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know anything about that. that is, well, yeah, that is no, a guess. Yeah, it's a guess for all of us at this stage. It's a guess for Harry Kane at this stage, which, you know, suggests that maybe he needs someone slightly better advising him in future. Daniel, good stuff. Thanks a million for See joining you us. Again, that's day, everyone. Cheers. Daniel Bye. Harris giving us some thoughts there. 12 minutes past eight. If you want to get involved, uh, leave a comment on the YouTube stream or you can tweet us at Off the Ball AM is the official Twitter handle for the show. Uh, OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We're going to run through the newspaper headlines, we're going to talk to James Scale, we're going to go to New Zealand to talk to uh, Gregor Paul about how uh, their rugby team is getting on at the moment in the uh, championship. But back with James Scale next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. Yes, Dublin aren't in great form, but they're bored out in their mind time. Paul Manny and Jack McCaffrey aren't playing, yes, because of the stress and the strain, but they're a bit bored, like, they're mid-twenties, they should be still playing football for Dublin. The likes of Conor Callan needs a Mayo coming to Crow Park, needs to be playing a carry in an all the final to really get themselves going, and I think that's where it's at. Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so. Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. OTB. AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It is 13 minutes past eight. You're very welcome along to OTBAM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Tommy with you all the way through until 10 this morning. If you've got a view that you want us to uh, talk about, or if you've got something that you want to get off your chest, 87 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can always get us on the YouTube stream as well. Now, uh, I am delighted to say James Skell is with us to preview the All-Ireland Hurling Final. James, good morning to you. How are you? Hi, guys. How's it going? Are you wrestling back and forth with what's going to happen this weekend? Are you trying to predict what Cork would do to top a Limerick? Or is this all about watching us uh, consume the coronation of one of the all-time great sides this this weekend? What's your oh, thought process? You know, it's a bit of everything, to be honest. I I, I count myself like over methodical at times, so I'm trying to crunch all the numbers and and, and, and see where, where the numbers lie. And every number I crunch it lies in, in favour of Limerick. Uh, would that be shot efficiency or concession rate or tackles or turnovers or possession and I put that all that and the numbers overwhelmingly favour Limerick and then despite all that I still can't call it because there's a thing called this corkness you know <laughs> which cork people have to say and when you get to a final it really shows itself even more so than, than unusual like what do I mean by that uh, it's like cork people are different you know and I mean that in the very the most respectful manner they're just, they're just different so like the, they're they're a nostalgic bunch, you know. They're they're very sentimental in terms of their history, like so they know they've thirty odd Irelands. So there's no fear at all from Cork going up towards to, to face Limerick, which 
which other counties nowadays might see as as a you know as a defeat waiting to happen. But not Cork. Cork are different, and I just think to have this thing ingrained in them as they have players, especially after the Kinney game, and now as a county because they're, they're they're seriously on the rise throughout both hurling and football. And I think there's a great confidence in Cork, and they're not going to fear Limerick whatsoever. And that's what makes me makes it hard for me to call. I'm looking forward to the game. I think it's going to be a real shootout, if I'm honest, yet, because you have two teams with real similar styles, one probably ahead of the other. So it's just going to be, I think, shoot on sight. And uh, I don't think there'll be much defending. Corkness is uh, Christy Ring standing at the dressing room door in, I don't know if it was the first of the treble winning team in the 70s where he's just saying we're Cork as they're all heading out the door and that's like that's what that team needed to get them over the line it, it's completely intangible it's not supposed to mean anything but we all know that it does somewhere if you scratch yeah. deep enough it means something particularly particularly when there's a team like this which has old stars who are absolutely desperate to win their first All-Ireland and a bunch of young players who like the Mayo team at the weekend don't have those scars yeah. from previous teams yeah yeah you're, you're right and I just think like that that's a huge thing to cling on to, you know, as as a court player or, or a manager or, or a supporter, yes, you've got that in your essentially your back pocket. And you can say that you can really kind of draw on that when, when things get tough. But I, I wouldn't uh my only concern would be that for, for Cork is don't don't align it, you know, because like nobody deserves anything when you get when they get to a final, let's say you you only deserve the trophy when you win it. So you're going up there thinking that look, oh we deserve this after what, sixteen years, you know, we haven't been in the final in eight years. You know we're doing so well at underage to say we've we've kind of we're taking on Limerick and we deserve to win. That's a load of BS. Do you know what I mean? So that that has to be put aside for the moment. So like I, what was that can be said to some 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 teams that I've involved with is, is that you, you have to have the like fire in the belly but ice ice in the brain. Do you know what I mean? So you want to really go out pumped up, ready to rock, but be really really ready to do your job and to go over, kind of reiterate everything you've done in the past couple of weeks and even the past couple of months and just bring it to fruition then on the day of the final. Because as you go as you go forward more and you go through the championship and you get to the pinnacle, like the margin for error decreases and decreases and the responsibility to execute goes higher and higher. So if, like for example, um if you look at the second quarter, if you know the, the Limerick in Waterford second quarter, and that was really where Limerick really blew out Waterford. And I just I went back over it again to see like what did they do like and how and they didn't actually do anything crazy. They were just extremely efficient. And they struck, they struck, what did they do? They, did, they struck 28 out of 31 hand passes on the run perfectly. And they struck 19 out of 22 stick passes to the hand under pressure. So that's an efficiency rate of like 90%, you know. So that's basically from the start up to the top. That's almost like no one laying a hand on the Limerick lads. That's just them getting the ball and moving it, moving it around and ended up in a score. So Cork are going to have to really try to shut that down. And then in reverse, Cork are going to have to do the same to, to, to Limerick. Cork plays a very similar style of position retention. So their efficiency for hand pass stick passing has got to be near perfect. And that's just what the final demands. That's the demands of a final. You, you, like a seven hour chain performance is not going to do for Cork. They're going to have to hit a nine hour chain performance to beat Limerick. Whereas Limerick are so strong and like so so used to their game game plan and have, have experience in finals now. Like a, a seven or eight hour chain would nearly would nearly do Limerick at this stage, if you know what I mean. So the, the big test is for Cork is, is to remain cool and calm and execute under pressure. That level of efficiency that you're talking about from Limerick's perspective, have we ever seen a team at that level before? No, no, definitely not. No, no. I think in hurling, definitely not. Maybe in football, um, I, I suppose, which is more evident after the weekend, you, you can you can really look back on Dublin's efficiency over the last six years or seven seasons, whatever, and, and see then the contrast that their inefficiency at the weekend against Mayo and say, right, that's what actually inefficient looks like versus what efficient looks like. So I think in comparison, probably the Dublin team, you know, how they went about their business, how they controlled games, how they created the narrative in games, that's what they did, let's say, so well. Limerick are, are doing that. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not, they're definitely not, they're not going to do five or six in a row. I don't think that's possible in Ireland. Um, but they're they're definitely mirroring what Dublin have done, you know, and it's 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 admirable to be honest. And like when you when you look through it, again, I'll go back to the second quarter. When you look through that second quarter and it wasn't just um, a simple hand pass for me, me facing you. It's a hand pass or a stick pass on the run in full motion, full flight, under pressure with a guy up your back or, or beside you. You know, so to execute that under pressure, but that's 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 a level that that you know I wouldn't have seen in a hurling team ever. You know, even the great Kinney team. You know, let's say with the guys' efficiency, they were more power and strength. Uh, then I suppose the, the efficiency of possession retention that, that Limerick have. That's the game, the way the game has gone nowadays, and Limerick are the best at it at the moment. But like I said, Cork, 
Cork were really impressive against Kilkenny. <clears throat> there was a big test. I myself doubted them against Kilkenny at, at, at the beginning, uh, before, <clears throat> the week before, and uh, they stood the test. And they came out. They came through with flying colours. And that that kind of mental test, and you, you, you've passed the test, will stand them uh, hugely uh, going forward. Uh, it, it'd be a bit like trying to get. Um... Rocky Marciano versus Muhammad Ali or Ali versus Peak Tyson to see what would have happened if the legendary four in a row Kilkenny team if you take their best ever performance and put that against the Limerick side because they're completely different styles it would have been like a, a knockout street brawl in terms of the outcome and I don't know what would have happened like you know the Kilkenny team was the greatest team that we've ever seen in, in hurling they, they do the four in a row certainly in the modern era mm-hmm. and yet like what would have happened if this Limerick side had been able to keep possession against them yeah, I, I just think that I think that evolution, you know, of of systems and teams will, will always win out. Like so, I have an uncle there <clears throat> at home here, and he keeps on to me every time I meet him. And I meet him probably twice a year, you know, uh, Max at any family occasions, and he would always tell me, "Oh, the eighty-eight Galway team would beat the seventeen Galway team." And I'm saying, "You're absolutely, you're, you're you must be on something. That's crazy." Well, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, so, let, like, can I can I try and make his case for that? Like, let's assume that they have the same base of strength and conditioning that you guys have. Can we do that? And then there you go. See, that's the difference. See, that's the difference. When you, when you start introducing, let's say, unknowns, you start introducing, you know, what ifs. Well, then it becomes a big Lam might not have been able to live at one of your corner forwards, but yeah, one of your corner yeah. forwards might not have been able to take the the, the beating with the stick that Sylvie would have given him. Yeah, I get you. Let's see, when you, when you create, see, he he himself creates the argument and says that. The 88 team on its standing versus the 70 team on its standing, the 88 team would beat them. And I, that's, that's, I completely refute that. You know, if had the 88 team had the same exposure to training, had the same, were operating under the same rules, then I'd say it could be a finely balanced, you know, competition. And the same argument could be made for Kikini and, and Limerick. I think evolution, where, where Limerick system is at now, would beat Kikini back in the day. You know. I, I think. I, look, and I, I buy, I buy that because that's like saying that the the Brazil 1970 team would all automatically get beaten by Burnley today. <clears throat> I, I totally understand that the current Burnley team, with their strength and and the wake programs that they've been on since they were 12, 13, and whatever other advantages they have. But like, let's assume that, um, you know, the Brazil 70 team gets access to everything that the Burnley lads have had. <laughs> their quality yeah. is is of a level that you they would clearly win that game. So I, I'm yeah. What what I wonder is is the individuality of that Kilkenny team, which was backbone by some of the greatest individuals we've ever seen, versus the the style. Would that have been able to counteract? And maybe maybe it wouldn't. Maybe maybe the. I I think I think definitely. Um, I, I I think it would. To be honest, like when you when you when you use that word individuality, and you think of the players that have gone through that Kilkenny team, you're talking. You know, if you're picking fifteen of the best players ever. You know, in the history of the game now, ever, you're probably going to have five Kilkenny lads on that 15 of that team. Yeah. You know? You're probably going to have Henry and Tommy and JJ, you know, and Jackie. And even like, you know, you're, you're giving up arguments in for, for TJ at that time and for Owen Larkin. No. So, and Mike Finley. So, so what you have is, is essentially Our- five of the greatest players ever to play the game were invested in that team. And I think if we, if we discuss this topic again in five years' time, I think the argument could be made. Just with the way things are going and with the, with the progression Limerick are making, the argument could be made that you could have two or three guys on the Limerick team who could be considered some of the best ever. Yeah. I.e., Keen Lynch. I.e., you know, a Kyle Hayes type people. You know, and they're awful young, and it's very, very, it's very difficult for you and I to discuss this and kind of make assumptions. You know, that this is this is going to happen. But like, I, I think there's great, there's good, you know, food in what you're saying with that that argument. You know, if you go into individuality, then it becomes a different case. But if you go current systems right now. Limerick win. Yeah, uh, sorry, I meant yeah. peak, peak Richie Power, I think I would have had in there as opposed to Chai. I misspoke, but I, 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 and look, I, I, I totally buy that. And I think that's, that, see, that's the bit where the start of our conversation with Corkness gives us pause for um, thought. But actually, yeah. Limerick's greatness is not yet defined. Their ceiling, despite how amazing they've been, we still, ha- we're not in, we don't know if we've seen peak Limerick yet. And the way that they've responded to any of the setbacks, the way they've responded to setbacks within games, suggests they're still evolving and mutating into whatever, whatever. in retrospect, we'll be able to pinpoint a match because that, that was their yeah. perfection. That was their Kilkenny versus Waterford All-Ireland final. Um, and that could, come, that could come this weekend. It could. Like, it, like nobody knows the ceiling until, the, until they come down. So they're, they're on the upward trajectory. And like, I have to say that Cork are with them as well. Like Cork, I said last week, Joe, that 
Cork were probably, you know, a year behind Limerick system, maybe 18 months, you know, because they probably introduced it at a later stage than Limerick did. But they're on the rise also, you know, and so like Cork ceiling is not yet known. So who who knows what kind of performance they're going to produce on Sunday, as as would Limerick, you know. And I think it's very it's very hard to like the game is, to, is so competitive, the county is so competitive that everything just keeps rising and rising, and, and so the level keeps going up. So when Limerick gets to a level, it's up to everybody else to match and exceed that. And then when that happens, it's up to everybody else, to, you know. And it keeps building, and that's that's how evolution the evolution keeps happening. But the trouble is, Limerick have not reached yet reached their ceiling. They're a better team than they were in eighteen. They're a better team than they were in nineteen. There are a better team than there were in 20 right now. So it's like, when is it going to stop? Do you know what I mean? And like, you look at Cork then, Cork were a far better team than they were in 18. So they've completely turned over their team. So from the from the, from the the 18 period, when, when they played Limerick in the semi-final and only beaten after extra time, and should have probably should have won Norman time, they've only got, I believe, two starts, which is Harnady and Horgan on, the, on their first, first 15 at the moment. Whereas if you go to the Limerick team, they have well over 10, 12. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Cork, Cork were, in the, were in the midst of a kind of a semi-rebuild and they're at that now and they've introduced great people. You, you have to understand uh, Patrick Collins and Rob Downey, these guys going to get their championship debuts this year. And look how look how influential the likes of Patrick Collins is on the team. Like, did anyone ever think Rob Downey was going to mark T.G. Reid over it? No, like I didn't, you know what I mean? And so that's just sort of a great a sign of youth that Cork have. So they're building now. And like, again, I, I use this term with Claire. And I think, and I, I actually, I do, I would like to see Cork win their Ireland someday. I really would because I, I would love to see Patrick Horgan win Ireland. You know, I, I think it's a travesty for a person who's given so much to the game and has been so influential to so many people in clubs and elderly, etc. through his performances, they just not get in Ireland. I, I often think of the likes of a Tony Brown or an Ollie Canning, you know, or Damon Joyce, who, who didn't get in Ireland when they, when, they, when they fully were entitled to one for all the reference, you know. And, and I just think, I, I do hope Cork win one um, for their sake. But I think to my point as well is that they're building more. And I think next year, even you could see an even... You know, the bar will be raised by whoever wins the championship this year and it'll keep growing, you know. And I just think Cork have a great, they have a, they have a plethora of youth, as we've seen, and they have the, the tangibles down there with, the, with with people on the board level and the club level that they can build something really good over the next, you know, 12, 18 months. Really yeah. good and sustainable. Sustainable is the word. That's that. That's it. I was, I was going to say, the thing that um, really, I think, terrified, particularly uh, anybody who is in Leinster, about Dublin over the last decade was what I was would call the industrialization of the process. They got all of their underage processes working and they now yeah. have so that they're they're complaining a bit about all oh, the the raw material of talent coming through isn't as strong as it was. Well you've just had an all time great slew of players, but there will be 55, 60, 70 intercounty standard players available to them who have been on conditioning programs from the time they were 13, 14, all the way through for the next number of years. So they're going to be yeah. grand. The thing about Cork yeah. was that over the last decade, we keep hearing about, oh, they've, got, they've got a team who wins Tony Forrestal and then comes the whole way through and then they win it the next year and then the under 16s are really good. And they don't win every game all the time, but they're competitive mm-hmm. at every level at underage and they seem to have a pathway that goes through UCC and they seem to have finally understood exactly that we need to invest in these players and eventually it's going to come through. We're starting to see that come through now and it's not going to stop. Yeah, exactly. Like It is starting to come through. I, I think they've changed their focus a small bit. You see, you can get overridden by playing the 24s, the playing the under 16s and playing the minors and wanting to win, 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 win. We have to win instead of trying to focus those kids. Like Especially, that's what they are. 14 and 16s are kids. You want to build them towards the future to have a player or a person that can be, I suppose, put on put on a, a, a track or a trajectory that they can excel at twenties and excel at senior, you know. And like I, there's a, obviously you, you've heard of the football club Cardiff in, you know. And every time I look at, the, at them, their model look, looks like the same thing, you know. They're under 14, 16, they look, but when they get to twenties and you know, under twenties and seniors, they're blitzing everyone. So like it, they, they have introduction of, of, of young guys that come through, like, you know, pretty regularly. So I, I think their concern is not with winning under 14. Who cares? You know, it's great, great at the time for the kids, great, great. But the major concern, and it takes it takes a huge vision because you can get distracted by by short-term winning at underage levels, but it takes a huge vision from people at board level and to, to get everyone around you at a management level and to build something that is going to be successful for Cork in five, six years' time as opposed to the present. Because you know, everyone wants to win now. Winning, winning in the future doesn't sound great because it's not here, it's not the present. So uh, you look back at the Limerick team, when they brought in Angie Daly and whatnot, you're going back a few years ago now. You know, think if you've seen these pictures of Kyle Hayes and these camps and, and, and Keen Lynch, and next thing we started hearing about these lads coming through, and before they got to 20, they blitzed the 20, now they're senior stars. You know, So I think Limerick did that, and I think Cork were in the process of it, and they're doing it really effectively. So we should 
prepare ourselves hopefully for you know there was, there was that period of time where Kilkenny versus Tip was the best ticket in Irish sport the stadium felt like it was literally rocking and it I, I hope that this is the start of a rivalry which defines both of these teams over the next couple of years yeah yeah I, I agree with you I I just hope I I do really I, I know what Limerick are going to come with like they scored an average of 27 points in the, in the last four or five visits to Crow Park East so you know what they're going to hit I just I want Cork to match them I want Cork to front them but I want Cork to be Cork you know I don't want Cork to, to alter their own game plan or alter their own team selection to try, try neutralise Limerick. I'd love to see Cork just go at them. And I think that's why I mentioned the Corkers at the start. I think they're just different. They're not going to kind of tailor their own game plan or tailor their own uh, selection process in order to try neutralise Limerick. They're going to try to do so, uh, tailor their own game plan and their own selection to try and attack Limerick. So, like when you see Callum Lyons switching wings to go over onto Hegarty, it kind of upset Callum Lyons, in my opinion, or in the semi final. So, what I want to see is Waterford, or sorry, excuse me, Cork, is go at Limerick play their game plan, stick to it, and see can you come out on top. Because that'll be the true test. If your game plan sticks or is, or is ultra competitive against Limerick, you know then it's, it's tried and tested and can be built upon. You know, so I just wanted to see Cork go at it and, and go at it, let's say, on a technical for, technically and, and execute as best they can and not rely on Corkman's. There's um, a, a bit of cuteness in, in Cork as well. The, the league game uh, earlier in the year, we were really hoping that something big would happen, but... Cork kind of decided. Actually, you know what? We're not going to show you anything in this. We're not going to. We're not going to engage today. We're going to keep our powder yeah. dry and, and wait for later in the year. And at the time, it was really disappointing. Now I'm kind of glad because it means that we don't have an expectation of what's going to happen, and there is that unknown, unknown. And I guess that was the whole point from Cork's perspective: is let's just put a little bit of doubt in John Kiley and Paul Kinnerk's mind, and and we're gonna. They're gonna have to wait till the first water break to make their changes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you just basically create a question, or you know, create a question for Limerick. Um, like if Limerick have all the, if they've seen the exam questions for the exam, or don't make it too easy for them, you know. And so like, if you track, if you track Cork's progression, let's say from that league game against Limerick, and the league game against Galway after or whatever, and you go to the first round of the championship versus Limerick, and you go to where they were against Kilkenny, there's been a solid rise. I think you'd agree with me. And their players in, like, Patrick Collins was championship debut was against Limerick, you know. So it's not like he's been around for ten years. So and to see the way these players have grown over the last uh, couple of months has been has been quite impressive, you know. And again, I I I sat here and I spoke to you the week after the league game from Cork for Limerick, and we we said we didn't know what was going on with Cork, we didn't know how they're executing that to bring on some of the big guns. But in hindsight now, you know, and hindsight is easy, that it was probably the right decision to start the team that did, you know. And like, no one cares about a league game in Limerick, you know. Everyone cares about the championship, the Ireland final. So what Cork did and what they've introduced over the last couple of months and put in place with regards to, you know, their, their, their systems, their energy, you know, and even the, the, the hysteria around the team has been hugely impressive. Like, and so they've grown, they've grown massively over the last couple of couple of months. And like you said, I think this could be the real start of arriving here because you look at Tipperary going to have to build, you know, um, like as we, we she did departing what not, uh, water are kind of, they've been taken care of by Limerick, you know, twice you could say. Yeah. And now it's up to Cork to, to try and carry the Munster mantle, you know. How much does the Munster Championship matter? It it's like it feels like it's a long time ago now. Mm. To be honest, uh, when you get to a final, I think I my my own belief is the the Munster Championship matters very very little. You can look back in that game and you can say there's a couple of uh, moments or instances whereby Cork could have could have snuck ahead of Limerick. Like I, I think of the the missed penalty Nicky Quaid save. You know I think of the the Kyle Hayes run from 70, 80 yards for, for the goal. I think of all the missed chances that, that that Cork had in that seven, eight minute minute spell, let's say from sixty minute onwards to try and close the gap to Limerick to three and it just didn't happen. They were shooting from too far. And, I, and again, I just think that the, the Cork game that time wasn't as advanced as it is now. Like it, there were still things decisions being made by players in that game that I don't think you'll see on Sunday. I don't think you'll see Tim O'Mahony shooting from ninety yards under pressure, which he was doing against against Limerick in the most championship. I think you'll see him more efficient. Um in, in, on Sunday because again like, you're going to have to play a certain system against Limerick you're going to have to run at them you know they, they force you to shoot under pressure that's why you see teams shooting a, a whole host of wides because uh, they're always shooting from 60, 70 yards under pressure because they can't get the ball in because they don't run so Cork are going to have to run them attack, attack, attack and, and try have energy and support runners that's why another topic as well George is, 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 is Shane Kingston like, he has to start for me has to start and you have to put legs in the half forward and take on that half back that's the key thing right so Kingston has to start because you can't afford to be coming from behind in this game. No, 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 you can't. I, I, again, it's like, you like, 
like when the great soccer teams get ahead, they just close shop, you know, and it's like Limerick now as well. When, when they get ahead, they, they have this excellent ability to close out the game, to manage the game a bit like Dublin footballers used to do um, and kind of to retain possession and keep tacking on scores. Like they're not going to stick back and not score for 10 minutes. Like they're going to keep tacking on the points. They're going to keep getting Seamus Flanagan on the ball. They're going to keep winning a couple of frees up front with Aaron Galan popping them over. So I think Cork are going to have to put their most energy from numbers 5 to 12 and just run the socks off Limerick as best they can. You know Hayes, Hannon and, and, and Burns aren't going to follow you around the place. They're not going to kind of trace you 50, 60 yards beyond their position. They're going to relatively stay zoning. So you're going to have to create numbers against them and create two, two, two on ones and get the Limerick backs going back towards their own goal. Like every game this year and especially this new final against Waterford, Limerick, like Nicky Quaid was, had to make a couple of saves, had to make a, re, a couple of really good saves. If that was a different goalie, you're talking about a couple of goals. So there is a couple of goals to be got against Limerick. There is, for sure. And again, Cork proved that. They proved that in the league and they proved that in the Munster Championship. And the likes of Jack and Connor, he could be keen to unlock that. Shane Kingston could be keen to unlock that. Alan Cadigan, Robbie O'Flynn, I hope he's fit. You know, they have to run at Limerick and try to create goal opportunities. You're not going to beat Limerick on points alone. That is a fact. They are too efficient. They get too many shots off. They put you under too much pressure. So you need to get goals against them to win the game. So if you've been crunching the numbers, do you have a scoreline in your head? It's, it's Limerick 27 points. Yeah, I have something crazy in my head. I think there's going to be over 55 points scored uh, between the two teams at least uh, on Sunday. Whether will that be, will that be you know 220 you know, to to whatever? Like I, I think there's going to be at least 55 scores at least. It's not going to be a, a 116 to 115 affair. You know we're going to be looking at 20, 27, 28 points per team. Oh, hopefully, because again the numbers the numbers will say that Limerick have scored 28 28 points. In their in their last four five five visits to Cork Park, an average. So so that's kind of your saying to yourself, that's what they're going to come with, you know, twenty eight points. So then Cork, but however, Limerick have also won their championship games by an average of eight points this year. So it's like, right, can Cork get, get twenty? And they will for sure. Cork have too much pace. They have excellent shooters. Aaron Dick can shoot from long. Flynn can shoot from long. Coleman, it's given. Mahoney, all the guys can shoot from distance to say within a certain zone. So I think you're going to see a good. A, a good a pretzel scoring. I think if I was to call a score for you right now, I think it'd be Limerick 30 points and I think Cork are going to hit two goals I think around 220. Okay, so a narrow win but it sounds like classic and, and hopefully the birth of, of a, a proper rivalry. Uh, you, yeah, I think so. Like, just you, go at it. Teams go at it. You mentioned Tipperary there in passing. Um, what did Tip need next to make sure that it's not a, a two-team rivalry for the next three or four years? In Cahill. That's the need. They need him to come in. I think they need him to come in with his. Uh, he, by all means, from what when I've been listening to down in uh, Washford, he's got a very um, how would you call it, a no-nonsense approach. So like he's certainly a very <clears throat> independent, strong manager. He'd probably bring back Mikey Bevins with him over from the Waterford setup. Um, and I, I, I'd be hugely surprised if he stayed in Waterford. I'd be hugely surprised. The job is vacant from uh, everything that has lined up from the stars of the lines. Now it's, it's, time, it's his time to take over the job. He's got his experience at under twenty one level and got sufficient experience at senior level at Waterford, so it's time for him to move across. When he comes across, I do expect, as I said uh, a couple of weeks ago, there will be a couple of panel changes, whether that be through forced or unforced remains to be seen. And I think he's going to try and inter, inter uh, those under 21 teams that he was successful over, the guys that, that won championships for him, I think he's going to try and introduce those at the senior level sooner rather than later and, and commence a, a bit of a building project. All right, James, great stuff. Enjoy the game this weekend. Thanks a million. Okay, folks, thanks. See ya. Always great stuff with uh, James Gale here on OTB AM. And that is an interesting debate. The all-time great Kilkenny team versus this Limerick team. Who wins in a straight shootout? You can give us your thoughts. Uh, 87 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream or tweet us at Off the Ball AM. 839. John Duggan's here. John, good morning to you. Jar, how you doing? What's going on? Um, yeah, bits and pieces, uh, sports news wise, Jar. Uh, Piedmont United and Champions League action this morning. Uh, against the Slovakian, not sorry, not, I'll start that again, Serbian team, Spartak Subotica. Um, kick off in the Netherlands at 11 a.m. Irish time. So we're amateur uh, team, Piemont, uh, their professional team uh, from Serbia, Spartak. Uphill struggle, I think, for them, but uh, we'll see how they go. Celtic in action this evening against AZ of uh, the Netherlands at Parkhead in the Europa League uh, playoffs. The first leg tie kicking off at 7.45. Obviously, fans now back in Glasgow. And Mick McCarthy's Cardiff City unbeaten in the championship early doors. Two-all draw at Peterborough last night. Uh, Fulham remained top, a 2-1 win 
over Millwall, Stoke City are second in the table. Uh, we saw James McLean leave them to go to Wigan yesterday. Troy Parrott on the mark for MK Dons. Uh, they beat Charlton Athletic 2-1 in League One. So Troy, two goals in two games. Good to see him uh, with the scoring boots on ahead of these qualifiers with Portugal and Azerbaijan coming up. Uh, in the championship this evening, QPR going to Middlesbrough. Birmingham against Bournemouth. Hull taking on Derby County. And Nottingham Forest against Blackburn Rovers. West Brom to meet Sheffield United. Speaking to James Scal there, but hurling. By the end of the week, Cork had a clean sweep. They could have the under-20 minor and senior All-Ireland trophies uh, on this side. The under-20s against Galway this evening in the final at Semple Stadium in Thurlis, a half-seven throw-in. Uh, Fergal O'Brien in first-round action this afternoon at the British Open facing Gary Wilson in Leicester. In the second round, Mark Allen takes on uh, Hossein Vafai and Jordan Brown faces David Lilly. Uh, Bill Murray is in Ireland, Ger. Oh, uh, yeah? Uh, playing golf. Whereabouts? Uh, he was in Drew's Glen yesterday. Um, what? Yeah. Um, and uh, he's involved in this thing called uh, the Lynx Life, some kind of YouTube series or American series. Fall to Ireland are helping out with it. Uh, so he's going to play Bally Bunyan. He's going to play, I think, Ennis Grown in the next few days. Oh, wow. Bill Murray is here. Um, I don't know if he's a, an OTBA a fan, but... Um, well, let's get him on. Yeah. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. Uh, Give us some footage, folks. We will definitely uh, send it out. He, he, there's a, a standing invite to Bill Murray to come and just talk about his golf game. We won't even ask him about but, all the amazing stuff that he's done. We won't ask about Lost in Translation or Groundhog Day or Caddyshack or Ghostbusters or anything like that. Lip them. Um, so, yeah, it kind of got me thinking about all the great golf courses we have in this country. And, um, you know, if you had your pick, what would you play? But, uh, yeah, Bill Murray's here. It's uh, great to see royalty in this country. Right. That is, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure playing golf with Bill Murray could be a bit of crack. Are you uh, expecting a Limerick win this weekend, Ger? Yeah, I mean, James Gale has given me pause for thought uh, with just bringing up the, the whole Corkness thing. Like, the thing about this Corkness is that it is allied to a a young team full of energy who still has incredible backbone of experience on the field. And, I mean, I've, I've made the analogy before about the Travelling Wilburys. You'll get that reference. Uh, Owen doesn't have a clue what I'm talking about when I mention it. But their backroom team is like people from every single generation Don't look great. successful Cork all the way Barack. back yeah I think Jar Cunningham is involved as well so you literally have somebody involved all the way back from essentially the late 70s to uh, 2021 who understand exactly what it takes and what it means and, and why Cork harvest all Ireland at the rate of one every three and a half years or whatever it is that they're at but also who understands the famine that they're in at the moment like We've the, it's kind of gone a little bit unremarked about how how big a famine it is for cork hurling. I think it's gone a little bit unremarked because the underage structures have been fixed, yes. and we're seeing those young players start to come through. And we're all a little bit worried about what the uh, imminent arrival of the rebel empire is going to look like. Well, the famine is as long as it has ever been. The last famine was 1903 to 1919. They actually played the 1903 final in 1905, so it was 16 years then. So if they don't win against Limerick this weekend, it'll be the worst ever. Um, now, they have had 12 years, 54 to 66, or 66 to 78. Uh, no, they actually they won the 1970 All-Ireland, didn't they? Um, and 76 as well. But yeah, there was it was 12 years, 54 to 66, and then 90 to 99, Jimmy Barry's team, the young team. Bit like this team, young team, fearless. Like, I, I think a lot of this, when we're looking at Mayo the other day, a lot of this famine and supporter and, and hoodoo, all that, some of these young lads don't even care about that. They won't even remember Sean Oak uh, or John Gardner or, uh, you know, Ronan Curran, that half-back line uh, from 2005. They're too young. Um, and that does give Cork, uh, I think, a freedom. Like, you look at Jack O'Connor in that game against Kilkenny. The one thing I don't know about you, Ger, but are you finding hurling as enjoyable as you would have had 10 years, 20 years ago with the amount of scores in the game? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think... Because you, you bring up the 99 final. I, I was actually travelling that year and, and paid my 20 quid in to uh, Kizar, whatever the pub is down there in, in San Francisco, and watched it, and it was terrible. Like, it was... I know, OK, weather conditions, not great, but it was a 13-12 in right, a hurling yeah. match. Do you yeah. know? So... Like I, I think that at the start of the year everybody's complaining the ball is um the ball is too light, it's travelling too far. The boss the, on the, 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 the game is not as good as it used to be. And then and then the, the teams started to play each other in championship and were of fairly similar standard and it was I thought relatively phenomenal stuff. Like when James Gale talks about 
the Limerick team's capabilities of hand passing the ball at speed to each other and stick passing the ball at speed to each other and the ball hits the deck two or two or three times out of 40 or 50 occasions it's a phenomenal level of skill that I think the early season debate about the death of the sport and the soul of the game being lost kind of poisoned the people a little bit I, yeah, I, I certainly think that when the game is played by two teams who are as conditioned and as skillful as each other it's, it's still brilliant that's my take on it yeah the impact of a goal has been lessened because teams now need to generally score 30 points to win a game. I'm going to be very interested to see in Croker and with a, with a with crowd. Fans, yeah, yeah, 40,000. Uh, do you know, I, like, so let's, I, I think next season, full houses, teams evenly matched, round robin coming back for Leinster and uh, and Munster, I think it, the game is actually in rude health. Yeah. Um, that's my take on it. I understand that people are definitely concerned about it, but there's a, a good piece in the Examiner today where they've, they've, um, they're playing with Cummins balls this weekend. Right. And um, it's the son now who is... Um, the Cummins All-Star Slitters is the choice. Kevin Cummins has delivered the Slitters to both counties and to Croke Park that are going to be used this weekend. And his mum kept the original ball from 1971. And he says he's weighed the two balls. They're the exact same weight. Okay. So obviously there are different, you know, the current ball is waterproof and it's probably... His grooves are different. Or it's probably whatever. a bit more elastic, but... Yeah. Um, and the hurls have changed, obviously, as well. Yeah, and it's, the, the skill level goes up. The evolution goes up. Yeah. Yeah, it's a different game now. Completely different game. Nicky English was making that point in the paper the other day that the aerial game, the power game, the Kilkenny's, the Tipperary's, the traditional game uh, has changed and it's the Limericks, the Corks, the Waterfords at the moment who are um, spearheading, you know, a lot of are around the half-backs the half-back play, five forwards moving a, a player back in, and that's why you have brilliant, like one of the best hurlers in the Limerick team is Kyle Hayes, um, and that's why you have the, these half-backs. It's, it's a completely different game. Like even 15 years ago, when Cork, um, the, when that three in a row was 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 um, debunked by Kilkenny, the scoreline was 116 to 113. Not hoping that happened in this weekend. No, no. I mean, if if there was an absolute downpour. Yeah, they still would only maybe score that if things went or I don't know what would have to happen for it to be that kind of score but and that that game was like brilliantly tense like a uh, fantastic game you know, and a game where defences were, were king yeah so um, w in terms of um, nerves and, and fans nerves yeah, yeah uh, I, I don't know about you but I remember the 97 final um, when you get into journalism and broadcasting it becomes work and obviously very enjoyable work but you do become a little bit more detached and um, objective rather than subjective about things. I'll never forget how I felt in that game between uh, Clare and Tipperary. It was 20 points to 213 at the end and the impact of goals again. Clare played their best ever hurling for the first maybe 20 minutes of that second half and then two quick goals, uh, Eugene O'Neill and Liam Cahill of all people uh, getting them and you know your heart just completely sinks and then Oddie Baker levels it up and then Jamesy scores as the winning point and um, it, for all these people in Cork who haven't really felt that in the last uh, 15, 16 years, it's going to be a great day on, uh, on Sunday. And Limerick still have that hunger, and I'm sure the Limerick fans still feel those nerves. But feeling the nerves is something I haven't felt in quite a long time. I feel it fleetingly at, at times. When the Dubs played Kerry there in 19, I thought it was an amazingly edgy game. I was nervous then. I'd be nervous, say, the first day of Cheltenham. I'm sure in 1998, when Kildare played Galway, you were nervous. Yes. <laughs> Still nervous about what happened in 1998. Still hoping that somehow half time never comes and uh, and go away. Don't get into the dressing room to um, to regroup. Uh, unfortunately, when you watch the movie, the same outcome always happens. It's just it's true. And all all sports cultures need their fans to have that moment of belief and. That's been the worst thing that's happened to Leinster football is that like I still think next year like Dublin will be 10 to one on to win Leinster if the championship structures remain the same. So you know, come on, go on, let, oh, come on, let's change it and let's uh, let's have the uncertainty of outcome, irrespective of uh, what teams are in it. Let's just make sure that everybody's playing. Well, that's what he's even saying yesterday. That uh, for me, Dublin, the certainty had become in all uh, to win five in a row. Once you've won five in a row, you, you don't really have anything to to, to uh, get anxious about it anymore. Uh, and then you win six in a row, and and, and like I'll, I'll probably enjoy being a Dublin fan next year more than I did this year. Yeah, uh, because there's that uncertainty, there's that hope of come on, uh, we can, you know. Well, 
they, do this. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that's a, a very interesting point that somebody m- was making the point after the game how quiet the Dublin fans have been. I watched the first half back again yesterday and there is a come on you boys in blue, come on you boys in blue that bursts out when it's 3-0 and then they score their fourth point. I don't know if it's, maybe I got that wrong, it's the third point, but it was one. it's one where they keep the ball, keep the ball, keep the ball and it's either, it goes back to Dean Rock, I think, and he clips it over with his left foot and come on you boys in blue is there. But I don't remember it after that. It's almost as if like... It's it's performative now as opposed to elemental. It's from, from the, the, emo- the, emo- perspective. the emotion has been removed. Yeah, because it's like yeah. exactly it became going to the the opera ballet, which is not the point of sport. No, no it's not. Um, it's when say you've got skin in the game of, of well, the Masters or something like that, or if you're going to say if you got a, a, a you know you're going to Cheltenham, you're going to a big sporting occasion, and um, you can feel that neutrality. But to have that investment, as as I would have had a couple of years ago in the Kerry games and those finals, they were incredible. Yeah, and the and the Mayo games, even the Mayo game in yeah. 2017. That, oh, like, that was still the best game I've ever seen. The the um the schools in Dublin have like a Sam Maguire day annually for the last number of years, where they just was sort of like, oh, we're all going to wear our jerseys on this day because we know that that's the day that we're going to get the cup in, like. That's just not right. It's supposed to be a competition. Yeah. There's it's not it's not a preordained thing. So I think there's a certain freedom that the rest of the football world is feeling at the moment. And if they back that up now this winter by adopting the correct structures for the game, Gaelic football, I think, is primed for a massive breakout. It's gonna be the sport that takes over the entire country. But like Anyway, that, that's a debate for another day because we, we've gone over time here. But okay. I honestly really feel like Gaelic football is primed for this massive explosion in popularity. It has male and female. It has brilliant role models. It has all the violence you want in a sport that never tips over the edge except obviously occasionally and maybe they could get a handle on head-high tackles. Uh, if anything Close to the lines, head, WWE. Anything to the head is a red and it's duty of care and the tackler would actually make the game even better so that people are only going for shoulder-to-shoulder challenges then and they don't take the risks? Imagine you had August or September, Friday night Division 4 finals, Saturday Division 3 and Division 2 finals all at Croke Park, and then on Sunday you have the grand final and then you've got Monday off a big bank holiday. Wouldn't it be wonderful you had these four meaningful competitions? Fix it. Fix it, JD. Fix it. <laughs> 88.52 this morning it's uh, time for us to turn our attention to rugby by the way if you want to get in touch with us 87 180 180 is the WhatsApp number and of course a reminder that OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors and delighted to say we've got Gregor Paul of the New Zealand Herald with us this morning Gregor good morning to you good evening to you how are you? Very well thanks we're one year on in this part of the world from Warren Gatland topping a pole as the worst coach in New Zealand and uh, we're heading back to you to find out have things changed after uh, after the Lions what was the was there a level of schadenfreude uh, around New Zealand or was it um, kind of meh who cares uh, pr- probably the latter the, the, the Lions to passed everyone by over here which is a tragedy you know for, for lots of reasons uh it was a tour which um, the rugby, as you would well know, didn't really ever kind of register on any kind of scale over here. Low entertainment factor, tour hijacked by uh, two coaches bitching and moaning about each other, and then three massively forgettable games while you know the All Blacks were playing at the same time. So I, I don't think anyone really paid any attention to it. That's very interesting to hear because ultimately there should be a way of selling uh, the world champions versus the Lions and it seems as if that has just not been capable. Is that is that is it primarily because of the quality of the rugby, do you think? If the, if the rugby had been good, would people have tuned in? Or is it that concept only really works when it's on your doorstep? A, a, a wee bit of everything. We can't forget the world that we're living in here. You know, the, whether the Lions tour was going to go ahead... Um, a lot of people here just didn't actually realise that it was going on um, because people aren't used to, uh, um, you know, people didn't realise that they were actually going to go to South Africa, uh, played behind closed doors. So there's there's a whole kind of COVID factor going in over the top here. So it's a wee bit unfair to judge it too harshly. Um, but, the, you know, there was no real build-up in the tour programme. Uh, that, that ended up being shambolic from what we could see over here, playing the same team twice, people catching COVID. So, look, it, it, it's, it's a wee bit hard to start judging the Lions tour as a success or otherwise and whether it's only of interest if you're hosting the Lions, if you're New Zealand, uh, Australia, South Africa. But the quality of the rugby 
definitely didn't induce anyone to get up for test two and three in the middle of the night and watch them. Fair enough. And you know, I think the more interesting stuff came out off the field. Yeah. And that ended up being a little bit embarrassing at the same time as well. It wasn't great for the game. It really wasn't, right? And uh, uh, the first the first time Razzie did his stuff, you're like, uh, okay, this is kind of interesting and it's entertaining and it's soap opera. And then the bit where the refereeing comes under the scrutiny we all know the refereeing comes under the scrutiny. We, you know, we've we've lived with Joe Schmidt. We've heard about the dossiers that he would have sent to referees, and uh, that's fine, right? That's totally fine. You do it in the right channels, but that video was clearly designed to be made public. That was the point of it in in the first place. It was, you know, yeah. he knew it was going to be made public because he talked about the potential repercussions for this video leaking. Like so, you know, yeah. therefore, you know what you're going to do. For me, it kind of represents a little bit of an existential crisis for the sport. If if that's where we're going then everything is fair game. And if you're in charge of the world champions, like the next time South Africa play New Zealand in a, a really massive game, let's say a, a World Cup quarterfinal, semifinal, final, mm. and, and pressure is brought to bear from the South African camp and the New Zealand camp doesn't respond in kind, if they were to lose that, the fallout for that New Zealand coach by not responding in kind, I presume would be fairly significant because... The, the the rules of engagement have changed by what Razzie did. Yeah, look, and I think you, I don't know if you're aware, but but Razzie's got a wee bit of form for this because he actually did something not anywhere near on the same epic scale, but he did do something moderately similar. Because remember, the All Blacks played the Springboks in the pool rounds of the last World Cup. And Razzie went on a peculiar rant before that game, the Thursday or Wednesday before that game, effectively trying to say, look, because the All, when the All Blacks were the number one team in the world, they they were given favourable refereeing outcomes as a result of their dominance. And then at the time, I think Wales or Ireland or whoever was world number one going into the World Cup, Razzie then suggested, now that the All Blacks are no longer number one, um, we expect the refereeing to amend itself accordingly and not reflect the fact that the All Blacks are getting favourable decisions by being the best team in the world. And, you know, Steve Hansen called him out the next day categorically and said that's a very disappointing public comment because we all know that's designed to influence and manipulate the referees ahead of the game. And we just don't want to be doing that. We don't want a sport where you're right, where, and, and you know, and Hansen was a big gruff creature that could stand up and defend the All Blacks, but, you know, why should he have to? Why should he have to respond to Razzie and create all these headlines and put yet even more pressure on the referees before the game? So, look, he... He had a wee go at it then, and to some extent, it wasn't a massive surprise that he just went nuclear on that, um, you know, while the Lions were there. So you're right, there is a massive issue now about how do you discipline him and how do we prevent that happening as a sort of standard state of affairs before we come into big test matches. And I don't really know what the answer to that is. Is that a topic of conversation in across the rugby championship at the moment? Well, look, we're not really there yet because we, look, we've got other issues that are bubbling away, COVID-related issues at the moment. Uh, and we don't even know. Look, the, big, the big game in the rugby championship with the big two games are going to be the All Blacks playing South Africa. And there's an added element of uh, drama built into that because it's going to be the 100th game between the two, the first time when they play each other. But at the moment, we don't know where that game is, where in the world that's going to be played. Uh, we're assuming... It, I mean, it's still officially scheduled to be played in New Zealand, but we've virtually given up all hope of that happening. And it's probably going to be uh, in Western Australia, in Perth. But then we're hearing now that the, the Western Australian state government said today that's highly unlikely. So like, we're in a real um, state of where, where's this whole competition going to be played? So we're not really in a mindset of thinking, you know, too hard about the, you know, the actual rugby side of things at the moment. Which maybe in the long run is a little bit for the best that actually we all get reminded that um, uh, international rugby coaches or directors of rugby throwing their toys out of the pram in the context of a global pandemic. It's no, it's no harm for us all to be reminded that the outside world exists sometimes. No, look, and that's right. And I think, like, there's a real sadness. I mean, in the context of things, uh, there's bigger things to worry about than rugby, isn't there? But in the same time, New Zealand's been COVID-free up until yesterday. <laughs> now we're back into lockdown. But, you know, the the game was going to be played in Dunedin, a 100th game. 
uh, already was sold out in minutes. Um, fantastic occasion. Everyone looking forward to it. And then warmth taken away. So there's a real sort of mm, rugby sadness about that, that we don't know where that's going to be happening. So when we do get a venue and we do get confirmation it's going to go ahead, I'd like to think that everybody just enjoys that fact that two great teams are going to go at each other for 80 minutes and yeah. we'll hopefully get a great game of rugby. I just hope that we don't get any nonsense. I don't know. But I see. <laughs> But, you know, Razzie's already wanting to put himself back as the water boy this weekend. Argentina are playing and Razzie wants to get back and do all that again. And even that's a wee bit of a of a niggly moment. I know it probably got on Warren Gatlin's chops a wee bit that, that, that Razzie did that. It doesn't feel like the right thing to do. Well, it's uh, it's being clever around the rules and titles and stuff like that. And, you know, fair enough. If that's, again, if, if that's going to be your culture, that's fine, you know. But don't expect the rest of us to think that it's class. Yeah, look, I, like I hope that I hope that we're moving into a world where, but just to go back one step, I mean, I'm not condoning clearly. No one's condoning what Razzie did, but I think you mentioned Joe. We've had Steve Hansen here for a long time, banging the same drum. In fact, every international coach of any major team will privately tell you the same thing. Look, there, there is an issue, and there has been for some time now about the quality of officiating around the world, not just with the quality of the individuals doing it, but the mixed messages that come from world rugby, as opposed to uh, Sanzar. These guys are being confused. We, we get different edicts and different hemispheres. I mean, look, the game looks one way one week down here and then a different way the next week. And I'm sure it's the same in Ireland that you feel like you're, you're playing different games week to week. And then when Ireland come down here and New Zealand go up there, it's all changed again. So. That, that's a, that's been an ongoing issue, but it's reached the point of crisis, I would have thought, where look, what Razzie did, the, the process that he went through was entirely wrong, but I can't help having watched it. I did I did sit through and watch his hour-long video, but the points he were making, well, I actually had a bit of sympathy for the points that he made because they weren't. it wasn't wrong with what he was saying. He was just horribly wrong in the in the way that he went around doing it. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, so I, I mean, I, I don't know if you also managed to sit through the turgid second test, but the first half was over an hour long and that was the week after Razzie's rant. So what happens when you tell everybody that they're no good at something is that they... Get inside themselves and begin to doubt. So, if you want to, if you want to fix refereeing, telling all the refs that they're crap uh, publicly might not be the best way to do it. There, there, no. there has to be an alternative to that. Although there has to be, I think there's a, there's a secondary serious issue here. I mean, if you're Ben O'Keefe going into that game, or, or you're, um, I can't remember the name of the Aussie bloke. Was it Nick Berry, the, the guy that Razzie really tore apart? That we, we've got to be really careful about protecting uh, the mental health of these guys. I mean, that's an untenable and unbearable position to be put in where your performance is being scrutinised like that. And then you, and then the next guy following you in is dealing with the pressure. And you're right, you know, I thought Keith, from what I've been told, he handled the game really, really well. But, but it took an hour to get through the first half because yeah. he had to kind of micromanage every decision and be certain about it. And, you know, that, that must have been unbearable for him. And if, it, you know, what, what, if he, what if there'd been a howler in there? Where would Razzie have gone next? If that had happened, yeah, who knows? Um, Gregor, are New Zealand back? Are, are, is the rugby that you're playing at the moment as good as it's ever been, or where are you in the cycle at the moment? Uh, it, it's, it's a wee bit hard to tell. They're definitely a side on the improve. Um, they, they played. They, they've sort of been slowly building towards that this year. Um, they they comprehensively um, destroyed Australia on the weekend. There were there was a level of fortune in there to some extent. Australia, um, wee bit naive, wee bit ex inexperienced, handed you know two very soft tries, one intercept and one where they just just didn't defend. Um, so you got to you got to factor all that in. Um, but yeah, look, they they look like they're a team who are growing, who are understanding what what they want to be doing. They've they've hardened up a wee bit. They were more direct. They were more physical. Um, Mwanga has come in, Richie Mwanga, that is, has replaced Barrett at 10. That uh, was a big decision, but he kind of earned a spot. And he's starting to grow and develop into a genuine international number 10. Um, and I think getting Brody Retallick back has made a huge difference. Back fit and, you know, injury-free, niggle-free. Like, he's a superb player. 
when he's um, when he's in that kind of um, physical condition. And Sam Whitelock has returned to being a world class lock at the same time. So that they've they, they've got a bit going for them at the moment. They're they're, they're definitely on a path um, on a, an upward trajectory. Um, traditionally, this would be uh, one of the years where Ireland does really well, or next year uh, where we're like, ah, oh, world beaters. Are, we haven't quite timed the cycle correct for a World Cup just yet, and that's our that's our holy grail. Uh, in terms of the cycle, from that perspective, I presume this regime will be in situ. There's nothing that could potentially uh, cause that not to happen. So, what's the level of expectation around Ian Foster's team and, and what they're going to be able to achieve over the next two and a half years? Well, uh, you, you're not quite right with level of expectation about. Like they're currently not contracted beyond this year, right? Uh, and and that has been a growing issue, um, probably more inside the team, uh, and a few outside the team beginning to get a little bit edgy about that uh, because there's a the, the uncertainty about what the expectation is about what these guys have, the, what the coaching team has to deliver to earn that extension, has never really been made clear. Um, and a lot of people here are thinking, well, look, they've won, they've won the Bledisloe Cup. They, they've, they're starting to play pretty well. How long are we going to leave it before we try and, you know, before we don't get these guys captured? Because there's a real danger here that some of them, some of the assistants, will get picked off by other teams if, if they don't commit to them. Right. If New Zealand doesn't commit to them, but look, we'll 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 see. There's an assumption that having won the Bledisloe Cup, that process will begin. And look, the All Blacks. The way it's going to work at the moment, and everything's in a state of flux because we we went into lockdown, and and, and in New Zealand, a lockdown means like we're only allowed out for exercise and um, you know essential food. So we're back in we're back there at the moment, and the the what's highly likely to happen is that when the All Blacks do leave to go, they're scheduled to leave for Perth on Sunday, they're not coming home again until December. So they're going to be on the road for 15 or 16 weeks um, playing 10 test matches, five in Australia if they all happen, and then heading over to Europe to play directly flying from Australia to America, play a game there, and then go to Europe to play. I mean, that's a hell of a road trip. That's old school, <laughs> you know, back in the days of a three-month tour almost. Yeah. Uh, and and the players have made it very clear. They don't want to head off on that mission without knowing for certain what the coaching situation looks like. So we're expecting that there'll be something um, coming shortly to, to give an indication that the that NZR board are going to be dealing with that before the team heads off. And is there a, is there a world in which Foster's not the coach? Well, <laughs> look, they've got Scott Robertson, who I'm sure everybody on your side of the world has heard of and is aware of what he's done as the Crusaders coach. And look, he his contract uh, with the Crusaders has been extended. He's publicly announced he's got a get-out clause um, should the All Blacks job become available. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I mean, they're putting the pressure on Foster in a way that I've never seen any other coach have the pressure put on them before. So, I mean, I, I'd like to think that no... Uh, that, that you know the board wanted to put pressure on Foster. They weren't you know they just wanted to keep him, keep him guessing up until probably about this point of the year. Um, and I would expect that they're going to start dealing with that now. But but look, it's yeah, there is a world, there is a world where they don't commit to him and they keep their option open to replace them with with Razor. Right. Okay, that's really interesting. Two quick final questions for you. What what is Gaddy standing in um, New Zealand coaching circles at the moment? Uh, look, hard, hard to tell, out of sight, out of mind. I mean, there's been a perfect storm of stuff you couldn't make up that everyone said, well, if this is what happens, then then there's going to be a real issue. And by that, what I mean is he was hired by the Chiefs in t- at the end of 2019. He was hired on a four-year contract where he was given permission because he'd already signed up to coach the Lions to, to coach year one, so 2020 with the Chiefs, disappear, coach the Lions, Chiefs have to bring in a temporary head coach, 2022, Gatlin comes back, takes over. So what happens if Gatlin has an absolute howler in 2020? Gatlin didn't win a single game in Super Rugby um, Aotearoa in 2020. Uh, you know, the Chiefs lost all eight games, had a horror season. Gatlin disappears to go with the Lions, new coach comes in, uh, Chiefs make the final and are a completely different team under the new coach. 
2022, Gatlin's going to come back, bump the bump the coach back out, and take over again. And that's a sort of crazy contract. That's not Warren's fault. The Chiefs signed off on that, which is just nuts that they did it. But there, there'll be a bit of angst um, about why the, why that's being allowed to happen, and the fact that the Lions have had a horror show as well has not really made anyone think you know, why why have New Zealand rugby gone on, out on such a limb to grant such an incredible contract to this guy doesn't feel right. Right. Obviously, they, they thought that it was going to be a shoe-in and there's somebody to put pressure on everybody else in the background as well. And is there is there any sign of Joe Schmidt taking a coaching job? Uh, he kind of, you know, he told us he was retiring from coaching and then he got that big gig with World Rugby and that makes a whole heap of sense. But we always felt that at some point he was going to have this unscratched itch. That doesn't feel like that. There's a new Super Rugby team uh, entering the competition next year called Moana Pacifica, which will be based in Auckland, um, and it'll be predominantly filled with players whose eligibility will belong to Samoa or Tonga. Uh, Joe was their number one target to take to to be the head coach of that team, and um, and I think they tried pretty hard to persuade him an exciting team to coach there's a lot of young pacific talent around the world but especially here in new zealand exciting well resourced again a bit of money to put it together but joe said no nah, not for him not interested quite yet so he's people have tried to lure him out and he has said no um so i'm picking that he's probably not yet looking for a coaching job all right always great to have you on gregor thanks a million we wish you the very best in that lockdown too hope it goes well for you Appreciate it. Thank you. That's uh, Gregor Paul on the line from New Zealand. Uh, late night for him, early morning for us, talking to us about what's going on there with the uh, rugby championship. If you've got thoughts on any of that, we'd love to hear from you. You can get us uh, 087 180 180, or of course, you can always get us at Off the Ball AM on the uh, on the old tweet machine as well. 11 minutes past nine this morning here on OTB AM. Here's what's coming up on uh, sports radio for you today between now and and 7 o'clock this evening OTB Gold is an Irish football special with Shea Gibbon, Niall Quinn and Jason McAteer being interviewed by Kevin Kilban so that is uh, as you would expect good crack our Mount Rushmore today is Meath our retro panel is about addiction at 4 o'clock and then OTB Gold is Colin Gooch Cooper talking at 6 o'clock we've got uh, Damien Delaney coming up just before 10 o'clock around about half past 9 here he is talking about Harry Kane have a look at this oh. On Harry Kane, so you're saying Chelsea and you mentioned like with Liverpool, a new arrival and how it energises everything. Yeah. If Harry Kane walks through that door, are you are you looking at Chelsea and looking nervously over at Man City a bit more? Uh, I'd, I'd probably not watch the league anymore if they go and sign Harry Kane. I'd probably give up, George, really? to be honest with you, because it was just, what's the point? Um, I think the good will be taken out of it. Um, I, I, I expect them to sign him, if I'm being honest. I say that tongue-in-cheek, of course, I'll watch it, but... Um, if they sign Harry Kane, then um, I think it's going to be very difficult for anybody to get anywhere near Manchester City. Okay. Um, but uh, look, if they sign him, he's a perfect player for them. He's a focal point. He's a goal scorer. Um, I don't think City at the moment are, are in a great spot with a false nine. I just, I just, I just don't like it. Mm. Pep, it overcomplicates Pep's game. It over, it overthinks it. It becomes really weird. You know, players playing doing odd things, which works sometimes, but but doesn't others. Um, so look, I think if Harry Kane signs, it could almost certainly revert back to a an orthodox football team, really, with mm. a focal point of a number nine and, and pace and legs and creativity around him. And so, genuinely, if they sign him and spend 150 million or whatever it takes for Daniel Levy to give it the go ahead, part of you will think, "Oh, saw this!" Like it's just uh, part, my, part, part of my soul will die. To be honest <laughs> with you, if that happens, you know. Um, I know that teams will give them a run for their money, but fully expect come February they'll go on a run like they did last year and just go and win 15 in a row um, and get over the, the the line pretty comfortably at the end of it. You know, I think Chelsea will push them all the way. I think, you know, Chelsea probably at the moment um, are, are going to be the only competitors or the real competitors. Chelsea might push them all the way. But um, look, man, I mean, Liverpool, I, I would like to see Liverpool get back to what they were Um Got a few questions, Max, around them or questions to be answered. So uh, time will tell, but mm. I do think they are capable of it. Absolutely. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Football is back. The Premier League on OTB. Football to Sterling! Raheem Sterling! 
Exclusive Premier League live commentaries every Sunday. The very best expert analysis on your phone and for free. Download the OTB Sports app now. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, it's 15 minutes past nine this Wednesday morning. If you've got anything you want to get off your chest, so get involved here, 0879-180-180. Owen's not here today because he is making his way to Limerick and Cork and we're going to be broadcasting from there over the next couple of days, building up to the All-Ireland Hurling Final on Sunday. We've already had James Scale with us this morning. If you're not already subscribed to our OTB GAA stream, then you should get onto the OTB Sports app. Do that now, ping on your notifications and you'll also uh, get access to the Paddy and Andy podcast, Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, to give it its correct title. Uh, You can get that first on the OTB Sports app. It uh, drops there every Tuesday and then on Wednesdays you can get it wherever you get your podcasts. Now, as I said, 15 minutes past nine this morning. If you haven't heard it yet, Talking Bollocks is a brilliant new podcast powered by Go Loud. We're going to be joined by the two hosts in a moment. But first, have a look at this. It's Irish Olympian Emmett Brennan. He's their guest on tomorrow's episode. It's easy to say you just change that lifestyle, but I don't think people realise... Like, this is what's causing mm. your problem. Because you're going out on the drink, because you're in that cycle. As you said, you're walking mm. bleed Monday to Friday. You've, you're on very little money as it is, and you're bleeding pissing her away. You're getting lens, you know, and like then, that. And then, we want to be saying I'm broke. Of course mm. you're going to be bleeding broke by going out gambling and drinking. Yeah. Of course you're going to be bleeding, throwing money on horses left, right and centre. Yeah. But it's, it's somehow normalised mm. to go out and spend 200, 250 ah, it's, 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 it's glamorised yeah. though, isn't it? It's so like, you're out with the boys, that was some crack. Yeah. I used to yeah. go out, I used to work at a, a good job, get good money mm. in it, go out and spend 300 euro on the night, yeah? Like, that's mad yeah. money. And I think, look, I think it's an Irish thing. Because the is. way at the Olympics, like, obviously you do have other countries there, but... None of my drinking like us. Yeah. Like, no. I just think it is an Irish thing. It is, yeah. The amount of talent in Ireland that's around through drink is on the hundred percent. Look at Shavier's yeah. Boxing Club. Yeah. We, we were, had a chat the other day mm. with a friend and he, he asked me, what story with like, Shavier's Boxing Club? Mm. Like a lot of people end up down the wrong road and that's what we talk about all the mm. time is because it's like that, you know what I mean? Like in there, like a lot of people have they've that dedication, they're committed to doing that thing. Mm. So it's either that road or else down that bad road to yeah. drink. And There's not more as well than waste of talent, boys. Yeah. Break your like leg, saying so, like, so we got to the Olympics, like, I'm quite average at boxing, but I have a very good work ethic and I do a lot of things right. In St. Savers, so I can name off top of my head five people that would, potentially could, be could world have, champions. That would have been Olympian, yeah. Olympians and would have probably gone on to be world champions. Yeah. But the gag around them and mm. other stuff around them and they didn't get there, I did. Right, that was uh, Irish Olympian Emma Brennan talking there on the latest episode of Talking Bollocks. And I'm delighted to say Terence Power and Calvin O'Brien, the hosts and breakout superstars of the pandemic, Terence Power and Calvin O'Brien are with us this morning. Lads, how the hell are you? How are you? How are you? All good, how are you? <laughs> uh, so... Before we get into Emmett and his, his, the truth bombs that he was dropping, the two of you managed to provoke him into that. Terence, I might start with you. When did Talking Bollocks start and when did you decide what you were going to do, what your ethos was going to be about each show? Well, we, we started last November, uh, only a couple of months ago, really. And um, we started with intentions to change the perception of the inner city. But by changing the perception of the inner city, we have to talk about um, the problems in the inner city and how we can fix them and how we can move forward. Um, like the inner city is a brilliant place it's unbelievable we grew up there we're from there we love it but there is problems in it and if we address the problems talk about them on a big enough platform hopefully we can fix them for the future generations going forward yeah you, you don't shy away from them either and you don't shy away from having people on the podcast that you disagree with of course not yeah look listen we had one or two people on who we don't fully agree with with the things they do, but it's 2021. It's time to sit down with these people instead of just being aggro and saying things online and doing stuff like that, which we've done in the past, but we're maturing. It's 2021. Let's sit down. Let's hear their points. We'll give our points and let's see if we can come to a common ground. And if we can't, so be it. At least we put it out there. 
Yeah, Calvin, there's, there's a fair bit of sports in the podcast. You've had boxers, you've had MMA people, you've had, um, I don't know if you've had the footballers just yet, but there's plenty of footballers from the inner city. So is sports something you were automatically, you, you were both interested in and it's kind of natural crossover because it, it covers a lot of uh, the topics that you want to touch as well? Yeah, and there's plenty of talent in the inner city when it comes to sport. We've a lot of footballers, uh, we've a lot of boxers, and then we're starting to see uh, a lot of people transitioning into MMA, but the NRC is a breeding ground of talent, uh, particularly in sport and in arts and other forms of, uh, of stuff like that. But uh, when it comes to sports, we've two uh, Olympians just back now from Tokyo. We've, I can name off the top of my head, three uh, Ireland internationals. There's there's caps to be, um, all over the NRC. But uh, yeah, sport is just a natural thing. To uh, It's easy to pull in people from sport because we know so many people in abundance. And I know in that clip you heard it there, um, there's so much wasted talent as well. So by touching on the problems, we are touching on that talents mentioned and bringing in sport by showing people that, look, you could have a gift here. Um, if it's nurtured correctly, you could reap the benefits of it. Yeah, I think it's really important that um, those stories get told. But I think it's almost more important that you guys are the ones who are telling them because it's very easy for people to come from outside and go... Uh, I, look, we, we've seen the, the narrative around uh, people from the inner city and uh, boxing and how this is going to transform the whole area, but that's not what happens. What needs to happen is that there's like a backup and funding. And like we were talking to, um, I think, the chairman of Kelly Harrington's Boxing Club and they still don't have toilets for the girls there. So unless there is financial support to back up what has happened, then nothing is ever really going to change, Calvin, is it? No, and it's not. And um, what Kelly has achieved in facilities like that is nothing short of a miracle. So can you imagine if that was nurtured and it was funded and invested into it and girls had a place to go and they had facilities, not just girls, but the boys as well, because some of the facilities aren't up to scratch across the board. But imagine what we could achieve then if we were actually getting backed and um, the, these councils and governments are actually funding it. We could see more and more Olympians coming out of these areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on, Terry, sorry. No, no, no. I'm just a grammar, and that's all. Uh, the um, success of the podcast. What do you what do you put down? The fact that the podcast has taken off, Terence. Why did that happen? Why was this ringing a bell for so many people? I just I just think that's the sense of community you get from the inner city, and that's where it all started from. Like we we started off with, with a phone on a kitchen table, just talking bollocks, <laughs> and that's it. And the whole of the inner city got behind us, and they backed us and supported us. Of course, you have to give good content. People aren't just going to jump on and support you. They're not. So we try our best to give good content and pull out the like we're not we don't shy away from um, the hardships in life and, and the things you have to go through. We talk about suffering with depression, we talk about suffering with mental health and addiction. And these are things that everybody can relate to. Everybody has a family member that's suffering. Everybody is out there suffering with one of these things. And we don't shy away from it. We have to be open, we have to be honest. I know I give a lot of that credit to Calvin for making me open up like that. We wouldn't have been that type of person. It's almost like a counseling session sometimes, they are that brilliant. And I think people can just relate to us. I think I think that's why we're going in the right direction. What was the first kind of few episodes where you actually realised that people were listening and it was having an impact? Episode two, I'd say, would have been that one. <laughs> nice and early, straight in. Episode one, just an intro, just to sort of see how witty we are and how we can have a better buzz. And then episode two, Calvin sat me down and he said, look, we're talking about this, this and this. And I said... Right, look, fuck a will just I'm not allowed course, sorry. Um <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just said look, we remember that we remember it and uh, the support we got from it was unbelievable. Like it, it I couldn't explain it. That was on episode two and it just keeps growing like uh, so that was obviously important in, in terms of setting the tone then, Calvin, that you were going to be honest about that. What happens after that is you start getting big name guests like, so you'd, you'd Liam Cunningham, you'd Philly McMahon in the first 10 episodes and then after that the, get, the guests get bigger and bigger. How does that happen for you? Do you know what? I, I still to this day, I haven't a clue. Um, I probably daily at this stage, me and Tana sit down and say, how are we doing what we're doing? We haven't a clue. We're literally winging it, but... If a closed mouth never gets fed, so if you don't try, you never know. So we're just messaging these people, and we're like, look, would you be interested in coming on? Um, and thank God some of them already knew who we were, so we must have been doing something right. So like Liam Cunningham, he was a fan of the podcast, he already knew, same with Philly, and it, that just increases your platform and it grows from there. So to us then, we can look back and say, Do you know what, something, what we're doing, it, it's helping people in the right way, and it's sparking conversations that, 
people probably didn't ha- uh, feel comfortable having. Um, not just through mental health and addiction, but other stuff, you know, and problems in society. Like even now, the hot topic is funding in sports. So like if we can echo that across the, the airwaves, maybe it'll fall on the right ears and we can get something done. Well, I, now's the time to strike, right? Like there's, there's literally the Minister for Sport uh, with a little bit of help from the Minister for Finance at the stroke of a pen could increase funding in the area to make sure that those boxing clubs have the facility they need. It, it's one person sitting at a desk who goes, yeah, crap, let's, yeah. Let's, let's do this. This is the right thing to do. And, and by talking yeah. about it and by getting everybody to talk about it, you guys are helping with that. Yeah, and I think in this week's episode, you'll hear that Emma talks firsthand on his personal experiences and his struggles mentally, physically and financially. And now he had to financially back himself to get to the Olympics. And you heard in the clip, he says himself, he's an average boxer. So can you imagine somebody who's more uh, naturally gifted than he is if they had the funding and if they had some sort of direction and some maybe guidance where they would be? And I'm telling you now, I know for a fact, we would increase the amount of Olympians we're sending over every four years. And the scenes that you've seen on Portland Row uh, last week, that could become a regular occurrence with the homecomings throughout the country, not just in the inner city, but in other areas and the working class areas throughout the country. Yeah, and to be yeah. honest, for, for every Emmett who makes it all the way to the Olympics, there are a hundred other people who don't make it, but who get the discipline and who get the uh, camaraderie and get the life skill sets that come from being part of it and committed to something that's like good for your health. Um, Calvin, what was the homecoming like? Just well, how emotional was that kind of outpouring? I've been driving around, we were driving the kids around that day, banging on the horn, going past the house, and they were like, can we go again? And it was like... It was emotional for us, and I, I live in Marino, so I'm not quite local, but I'm pretty local, for you guys to have a gold medalist coming home to see the bunting, to see to see made physical, the community spirit, that must have been pretty special. It, I can only, the only time I've ever seen anything like that was when Ireland was in the World Cup in 2002, and that's the only thing I can relate it to. It was unbelievable, and that's pushing 20 years ago now, so there's generations who won't have a clue what I'm talking about, but Kelly and Emma coming home down Portland Row on the bus will be their moment. That will be their Ireland coming home from Japan and uh, South Korea. That was unbelievable. Um, and it'll be one of them moments you look back maybe in 10 years' time or when the next Olympics rolls around and you'll be like, remember last time when, when Kelly brought home the goal? That was great. Where were you? We were there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, stop. We, we, we had shivers for the whole thing. It was unbelievable. And what I love the most is people got to really see what the inner city communities are like. Because when, when the two of them were coming back in that bus, everybody got together. It was like Paddy's day it was. It was unbelievable. One, one of the best things I've ever seen, yeah. Unbelievable. And, like, what's the impact of that then? How do you make sure that their impact is carried on? Well, look, if it, it can have a ripple effect and, and younger kids can look up to Kelly and Emma and see what they're after achieving, especially with the lack of facilities and the lack of funding, if they can see that and go, right, well, look, it's possible. That's all you want as a young kid to go, it's possible. And then they can push on and give it a pass, you know what I mean? And even if they don't make it all the way to the Olympics and make it as far as they want, they'll learn that discipline, they'll gain confidence, yes. they'll do things like that by going into these places. And, and that's that's all we care about. We we care about the younger kids coming up and seeing that there is hope for people from the inner city. And that includes even just us still doing a podcast. If a younger kid can look up and go, if them two idiots can do a podcast, <laughs> Joe can I, do you get me? You know, that's I do. I was going to say, I wasn't going to use that language, but I was going to say you two are actually uh, in your own way, in your own quiet weekly way, delivering that same sense of possibility for people in the locality as well. And look, there's, there's famous photographs of when the rowers came back five years ago with their silver medal that uh, Fintan McCarthy was there celebrating, watching them, thinking this could be me. And then he came back this time with a gold. So hopefully exactly. there yeah. are some kids uh, in Portland Row and in Xavier's or in whatever other local boxing clubs um, actually thinking that they could do it as well. So uh, what's next, Terence? How do you how do you continue to build on this? In, in terms of us or yeah. the boxers? No, or? you, you guys. That we've, we we've... look, listen, we just keep doing what we're doing. Look, there's no structure, there's no plan to what we do. Like, it's madness. That's why we keep on saying we are winging this. We're just going <laughs> with the flow. Every week we go, right, like, what's next? We're doing things two, day, two days in advance and things like that. You know what I mean? People are booked up on months. We're doing things two days in advance and just running with it. And just look, listen, just keep putting out good content and showing that there's hope and possibilities for the younger kids coming up. Well, that's where the great art is made, where it's unconscious. 
Yeah, yeah. But well, look, listen, it's all off the bat, you know what I mean? There's no rehearsing, there's no... Do we, don't, we don't look anything up, we just go in and just go off for it. Well, it's yeah, been... Yeah, it's from the hack. Well, mm. it, it's definitely resonating with people. It, as I said, it's a, a smash hit. Congratulations to you both. And uh, thanks a million for joining us this morning to explain all that to us. Cheers. Thanks very much, Thanks Pat. for having us. Terence Parrott and day. Calvin O'Brien there. And the Emmett Brennan episode is episode 36. It's released every Thursday and it is uh, on goal out. And it's called Talking Bollocks. So just search Talking Bollocks for that one. Uh, that is pretty much uh, us for now. We're going to bring you the full length interview with Damien Delaney and Joe talking about what it's actually like to Mark Lukaku, uh, his thoughts on Harry Kane in some more depth as well. But a reminder, OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We're broadcasting live from Limerick tomorrow as Owen Sheehan captures the feeling in the county ahead of the All-Ireland final. Tommy Walsh will join us and there's much more as well. As I said, here's Damien Delaney in brilliant form on the football show with Joe. Interesting start to our Sunday commentaries here and off the ball. Nathan Murphy and Stephen Doyle there, and we are very happy to say Mr. Damien Delaney joins us. Hello. Hi, Joe. How are you? Good. It's been a while. So, Premier League season up and running. Post Euros, were you hungry to get back into your Premier League? Um, I was, uh, surprisingly. I think after the Euros, we were all due a break, you know, um, with the uh, kind of condensed season last year, straight into the Euros. Um, I think everyone needed a little bit of a break, um, but it was fabulous actually to have it back on our screens and and, and kind of organising your weekend around which live games you want to watch. So how long after the Euros final before you were aching for it? Kind of five, six hours, yeah? No, actually, it was probably only the week the Premier League season was about to start. It was kind of maybe Tuesday last week and I started looking at the fixtures and I thought, oh, Arsenal, Brentford, that's interesting. And that kind of got me going a little bit. And then the result of that um, took me into the weekend. But um, not long getting back into the swing of it. No, it's true. Hey, spare a thought for Phil Jones. Bad enough they signed Varane. He then marches into the club and says, I'd like the number four jersey, please. To which Phil Jones said, absolutely not. I think that's fair enough on Jones's part. He's had a miserable time. He's been out 18 months injured. New signing comes in, probably going to make it his life harder to get it back into starting lineup if that was ever a possibility anyway. And uh, he comes and asks for your jersey. Is that not a bit disrespectful to pitch up at a club and say, yeah, I'm going to take his jersey? Um, ooh, that's a tiff one. There's an awful... There, there are a lot of facets to that discussion or an awful lot of points. You know, if, I know Phil Jones is probably should be on his way out the door um, and maybe he's kind of laying down a marker that that he could make life difficult for United if he hangs around. Um, I, you, there's too many ins and outs to that. I don't think it's too disrespectful. I think if a player shows up, and I don't think he would have marched and just said, "I want number four. It would have been a it would have been a it would have been a, a polite question to um, you know probably to the kit man or to uh, somebody and say, "Hey, listen, is number four available?" Yeah. And they're saying, well, you know, that's a decision the manager has to make, really. Um, and that's probably the first big decision he'll have to make mm-hmm. this season, Solskjaer, is whether to to, to, to take the number four off um, Phil Jones and give it to Varane. But if you do that, then that's the end of Phil Jones, really, because he's never going to do anything for the club ever again. Not that I suppose anyone's holding out much hope that he is going to do anything. You know, I think it's probably best for Phil Jones and Manchester United if he kind of moved on quietly. Yeah. I hadn't quite realised he'd been out injured the whole time I mean he's not a starter anyway so he's not someone you're checking up on when he's not in the starting lineup all that often so he's been injured for the last 18 months Solskjaer said he's very close to a return he's played some under 23 matches 29 years old now uh, Phil Jones as well so it is the manager who decides ultimately is it generally on squad uh, numbers like yeah, that yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. I mean, listen, I mean, you know, the, the, the marketing department would probably have a word and say, look, it would be great for us if you could get the number four because that's a, a much more marketable thing. But I think yeah. ultimately um, the manager has a final say on that. Um, I don't think any manager would go to a player unless he was really trying to move him out of the club and say, listen, you're losing that number. But, you know, the question probably was asked and he said, no, I want to keep it because maybe Phil Jones believes he has a future at Manchester United. And if he gives up that number then maybe he thinks that's another step closer to the door for him. But like I said, there's so many kind of moving parts in that discussion um, as to how it would transpire. But it wouldn't be as blunt as Varane walking into change room day once and I want your number four. It absolutely <laughs> would be that. No. I know, I've, I've tabloided that up a bit. He went in, he pointed to Jones and he said, you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nobody. 
Yeah. So I mean, the, voice, the, voice, the voice faculty probably had to walk in there and says, who wears number four? Probably tells you where Phil Jones's career is at, you know? Well, it, I mean, it's so tough on Jones. I would think, I mean, Alex Ferguson has done a lot of great things. I would think coming out publicly and saying that Jones could be the next Duncan Edwards probably didn't help him along in his way. I mean, they were some big shoes to fill, obviously. Um, yeah, but so. at, at the time he was a highly regarded young player. I mean, he was, you know, could play a variety of positions mm. uh, and obviously they had hopes that he would nail one down but Alex Ferguson saying something like that is obviously just to give the kid confidence that when he comes into United. So, there's, again, there's probably an awful lot more behind that statement than, yeah. than, than the face of it. But, look, it hasn't transpired uh, that Phil Jones has fulfilled anywhere near that type of potential and um, I think probably it's best for him if he moves on but, you know, Manchester United are stuck with a player that's on an, uh, an astonishing amount of money um, and he is not going to get that money anywhere else in the Premier League if if, if, if the, the reports of what he earns at United is true. Mm. Uh, you know, so Manchester United are going to have to cut him a, a, a rather large cheque to get him to move on. I remember when Cantona left, Beckham was very eager to get the number seven jersey and Ferguson was very reluctant, almost just keep this kid in his place you know let's not let this thing happen too quickly for him and of course he got the seven jersey and now uh, very much associated with it I've no idea I've no idea what number you were um, I, I, I wasn't a big one on numbers uh, the kit man usually assigned uh, me a number um, whenever you sign for a football club the kit man would kind of come to you and say look X, Y and Z is available and I say, I think at once I say, I don't really care. You pick it, and he picked it. So I think that's how I ended up. With, that's how I ended up with twenty-seven at Palace. 27. I used to wear twenty-seven, yeah, um, because obviously coming in. Um, you wouldn't say late. it's iconic, really. Twenty-seven. Well, I, I, I would argue that it is no Joe. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they've retired it. They've retired it. <laughs> no, I say that joking, obviously. Before people think I'm nauseous about myself. <laughs> oh dear. I wonder, has anyone taken the twenty-seven jersey since? Uh, the young left back Tyree Mitchell took it. Oh, you um, noticed, you checked, you noticed. Absolutely, I checked, and, I, and he wore it last season, and then he gave it up this year, and he took number three, so no one has it. <laughs> okay, so officially they've retired the number twenty-seven jersey um, <laughs> yeah. due to unpopular demand. Well, Varane is number nineteen for those interested in those kind of things. By the way, so I wanted to ask you. I'm glad you brought up Palace. There, kind of an interesting case. Patrick Vieira is the Palace manager. They were beaten 3-0 by Chelsea. Now, they won't be the only side beaten 3-0 by Chelsea at Stamford Bridge this season. But there is a sense that Palace might be in for a tricky season here. Patrick Vieira, I was having a glance back at his record. Obviously, there's the Man City stuff, and then he was over in New York for three years. I don't know how much you want to read into that. And Nice really is the main uh, bellwether indicator of, of how he's going to do so he was there 2018 to December 2020 two and a half years 89 matches uh, so so like they finished up in his final year they were in 11th when he got the sack the, there was a five game losing streak one of the things said about Vieira I was just reading in the French press was that the team lacked a discernible style of play that he was constantly changing team selections constantly changing formations now, he would argue, he would argue that he finished fifth in 2020 in the shortened COVID campaign and that in his first year when he signed, two or three very important players were sold from beneath them. And then he was eventually given some money by new owners and that was the year they finished uh, fifth. And what he said when he arrived in 2018, if we're looking for a sense of what Vieira is about, uh, this was at Nice. He said to the keep, I'll try to impose a style of play, lots of one-twos, attacking football, Ulst while having a compact defensive block. And obviously it you know, didn't quite work out for him as he might have hoped. So um, Palace this year, you'd have your finger on the pulse. Are they in a bit of bother? Um, ooh, I mean, that is uh, a, possibly, yes. Um, but I think they were expecting that. Um, they were expecting that they might have to take a couple of steps backwards um, to be able to progress forward. Um, first thing I say is that the path that, that, that Crystal Palace was on um, was destined to end in relegation. Um, you know, with the ageing squad, uh, the manager, uh, his style, um, it will get you so far. But Roy Hodgson is the type of manager that um, wants experienced professionals who could come in the change room day one, uh, read between the lines of what's expected. The manager tells them something once and they go and do it. Um, and that obviously leads to having the highest average age in the Premier League of, of a squad, and that's what they had. So it needed changing. Absolutely it did, and the chairman had to, 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 to kind of 
draw a line in the sand and say, hey, listen, this way we are dying a slow death and in next season, possibly two, um, we, we're, we're going to go down. Um, so he had a decision to make. Do we go like for like and swap out Roy Hodgson and bring in a, a Sean Dyche type character and play percentages and, and whatnot? Or he decided to, to move and flip it quite literally 180 degrees in the opposite direction and go for youth uh, exuberance and, um, and and that direction. And uh, in doing so, they brought in so they let go, first of all, uh, 12 very, very seasoned uh, uh, campaigners, uh, Premier League campaigners, and they brought in uh, four or five not-so-experienced young championship players allied to that, a manager who was never managed in the league, although he had such a fabulous playing career. So I'll just, in, I'll just it, interject and say, everything so far is making me nervous. Absolutely, 100%. And, 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 and you should be nervous. Um, and I'm a little bit nervous. But the pivot had to be made... Um, and I think he's just decided to go uh, all in and do it. The best thing about Crystal Palace Football Club is the the catchment area of, of Croydon in South London. You've got Millwall um, kind of to the to the east, uh, which is on the Thames, and you've got Brentford Fulham to the west on the Thames. Uh, Crystal Palace pretty much has the whole of South London um, for a, a, an area to choose from, and I think there's over a million people. Uh, in 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 in, in the, the the greater Croydon area, mm. um, so basically for years Crystal Palace used to lose an awful lot of high end talent. They also produced an awful lot, like Sir Wilfred Zaha and Nathaniel Klein, uh, 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 people like that. But obviously they lost Smith Rose, a Croydon boy, who's gone to Arsenal. Lost his cheek at Chelsea, a Croydon boy. So because they weren't a Category One academy, they no are a Category One academy. So they've kind of spent tens of millions on this academy which opens uh, very very soon it's open now but the official opening is coming up very very soon so the, the 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 plan for the club moving forward is now to get in all that young talent from South London nurture it and sell it on um, if, if, if if needs be the likes of Aaron Wan Basaka is kind of the, the, the prototype there um, but even if they get all that right the first team has to maintain what it's trying to do and it's a it's on a knife edge for me um, no, a whole lot of people will read way too much into the first day, day of the season and they shouldn't there's an awful lot long way to go um, the team had a, an eerie kind of familiarity to what the team was last year there was a lot of injuries a lot of players who kind of were at the European Championships and didn't start so um, the manager is going to need uh, a little bit of time to put it together but I'm also acutely aware that uh, the first five fixtures with Chelsea I think they've got Liverpool Arsenal and I think you've got Brentford next week Spurs actually I think is, is, is the other one so they could be five games in and have a point and when you don't have a whole lot of experience or a really experienced manager to kind of keep everybody calm it can disintegrate very 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 quickly um, so uh, it's on a knife edge for me but in, in, in the club's defence I think the, the pivot had to be made and they've decided to do it now and they're pot committed um, so uh, time will tell how it will play out um, I actually got a real good insight on Saturday I was working the uh, Chelsea Palace game with Richard Dunn and uh, obviously Richard lived in, 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 in France and, and, and Rich um, had a really good insight on, on, on Nice because he used to go and see them play and stuff and he told me a whole lot of things of eerily similar to what you were reading out there about Vieira that when the pressure came on that he became a little bit of a pain splatter um, and became very, very hopping from one system player to the other and got caught in a muddle. Uh, and that's why the, the second season didn't go so well for him, that when the pressure came on, and I thought to myself, Jesus, at some point in the Premier League, he's going to come under an awful lot of pressure. Um, and you're going to need a manager like Roy Hodgson, that when you lose three in a row and you're slipping towards the relegation zone, you want a manager... I always want a manager to come in with a demeanour and a look about him that I know what's going on and I know how to fix it. Even if inside he's doing somersaults and he's panicking, mm. you want to look at a manager and feel like he knows the route out of, of, of the predicament we're in. Not a guy... Because Matt players, by the way, can tell. When a manager's panicking, they can tell because he's chopping and changing formations. He's scrambling, he's scratching for something to click. And that's not a place you want to be as a manager because players can see right through that. And that lack of confidence or that uncertainty that a manager displays almost certainly feeds into um, in, in, into the starting 11. Jeez, mm. that's an interesting answer. God, it's nice having you yeah. back. One that question. Was long, well. No, no, no. <laughs> that was amazing. That was so interesting on Crystal Palace. So I hadn't heard that anywhere else, really. So look, I understand the pivot. That St it's Steve Parrish is still very involved there, isn't he? Yes, yeah. he's, a, he's a, the, the CEO. Yeah. yeah, really smart man. I know we've spoken before and I know you rate him very highly. Very smart man. So I understand the pivot at academy level and where that makes sense. A catchment of a million... We should be hoovering up the talent here. Get that box ticked. Brilliant idea. Let's move on. That's a no-brainer. 
as part of the pivot, though, I'm sure they would have had deliberations whereby they say, right, this academy is not going to bear fruit for five, six, seven years. Let's go from Roy Hodgson to something still reasonably safe and bankable. Someone who has a great chance of keeping us in the Premier League. So we're not going to tell the fans this, but our aim is just to stay in the Premier League for the next few years, hope this academy thing works, and then let's see about progressing. Whereas they seem to have gone, OK, academy, brilliant, and let's let's really mix it up at first team level as well. And they've taken in someone so untried and untested in Vieira. And I'm not quite sure the logic of that one. I, I get the pivot at underage yeah, level, yeah, but yeah, yeah. The, the, the jump from a Hodgson, like almost as yeah. close to a guarantee of Premier League status as yeah. possible, yeah. to a Vieira, which is just like shot in the dark almost, it feels like. That's a hell of a leap. Um, it is. Uh, it, it, I wouldn't quite class it as a shot in the dark, but I mean, you've got a young, enthusiastic, hungry manager who obviously interviewed very, very well, hence the reason he got the job. Mm. Um, and obviously, Steve Parrish would have pointed out a lot of the points I just said to you there, that it's youth, it's, you know, we're bringing in young players, we're signing the top-end talent from the championship, the likes of uh, Eze, uh, Olise, uh, the boy, the centre-back, uh, Guihi, or, or Guihi, I'm still not sure to pronounce the chap's name, yeah. um, from Chelsea. Um, you know, so it's young, up-and-coming players. Um, ultimately, with the sell-on value, because Crystal Palace for years have spent fortunes of money and then players have just drifted away from the club because of old age. Um, so I think the manager is, uh, or the, sorry, the owner is, is, is aware that he wants to kind of bring in 20 to 24 year olds that if they do catch fire and light the world at Crystal Palace, he can't sell them on at a, at a profit. But to address your question, and it's an extremely valid question, this question I'm asking, hmm. um, or a question I, I've thought about, but he's obviously decided that, you know, he's going all in. And he just thought, look, this is the way to do it. Um, and there's no point in half, half assing it. Um, mm. And time will tell. Again, yeah. like I, everything you said there is, is very, very valid. But um, you know, he's an extremely astute man, extremely clever, um, incredibly decisive man. Um, like you saw with the Frank de Boer situation, um, that if he's not happy, he 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 will not stand on ceremony. He will um, pull the trigger. Yeah. Um, and I can guarantee you he has a plan B in his back pocket somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. In the media, it's very easy for me to simplify this and say, oh, look, what's he thinking? I mean, as if Steve Parrish hasn't thought about this 20 different ways, you know, and yeah. has got logic there. I always remember you telling you saying to me that with Parrish, you were always struck by his ability to consume a lot of information very, very quickly and digest the important parts yeah. as well. Yeah, he, he, he's got um, incredible instincts. Um, he takes the information in. And he processes it very, very quickly, and um, he makes an incredible amount of correct decisions based on that. And I think he does trust his instincts uh, as a businessman. He he was obviously um, incredibly successful as well, mm. um, and he is an astute guy. And I've spent a lot of time with him and in his company um, socially as well. Um, and he's somebody that I would, you know, respect and somebody that I would talk to. And when I say talk to, I would listen to. You know, because you realise that there's some people you can learn from, and that's when you shut up and listen. Yeah. And he's somebody that I would always just shut up and listen to because um, he is um, as as clued in as you're going to get, in my opinion. Hang on, all you do is talk when you're around me. <laughs> 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 so um, on Vieira, on Vieira, I gotta say he's never jumped out to me as a. I mean, what a player, obviously. And he's, in fairness to him, built his career slowly at City and then New York, so he can't fault him in certain ways. He's never jumped out to me on TV or anything as an unbelievably insightful thinker on the game in so much as any of that is indicative of anything. i I got to say, I'd have slight worry over Vieira. Yeah. What's your sense of him as manager? Yeah, I, I think similar. I mean, you know, uh, people I speak to know, they love him. He's, he's approachable. He's, okay. he's, he's, he's nice. He speaks to players. But that was pre-season. I mean, everybody's nice pre-season because, you know, everyone's enjoyable. Pre-season's nice, isn't it? You know, you're playing friendlies and, you, you know, the only thing you're told is not to get injured. So it doesn't matter whether you play well or bad. It's, it is what it is. Um, if they lose against Brentford on, on, on Saturday, that's when you'll start seeing more of, of, of what he's like. That's when the pressure comes on and pressure does funny things to people. Um, mm. Pressure does things to people that they didn't think they were capable of. Um, and often people, managers will look back at how times or they reacted to certain situations and they're surprised themselves. So um, time will tell, you know, um, but I'm very much uh, hopeful um, and I hope they do get it right. Um, and again, at the moment, they're not looking to finish in the European places. I think if, if you offer Crystal Palace fourth bottom today, they take it. Um, and do I think there's three worst teams in the league than Crystal Palace? Uh, almost certainly I yeah. do, yes. 
Um, so I think that's their aim at the minute. And then over the next two or three years, as I said, they've kind of took a couple of steps back to, to open up a, a better path forward for them. OK, really interesting. I must admit, I hadn't planned on spending the first half of the football show on Crystal Palace, but <laughs> here we are. We're going to take a very short break and uh, we've loads naturally enough now to talk to Damien Delaney in the uh, second half about football and off the ball. Is with thanks to Paddy Power for information on responsible gambling. Visit gamblingcare.ie. Short break, and then we're back with Damien Delaney. I don't think it's so much that Desi was wanted to change everything. I just think that if you suddenly have a dressing room and there's no Mannion, there's no McCaffrey, there's no Michael Dara McCauley, there's no Paddy Andrews, there's no Kevin McMahon, these are huge figures. And no matter what, it's like, you know, when they talk about when big lads. Uh, big sort of figures and characters come into the dressing room and everybody's performance and training increases by 20%. There's no way that a lot of the young Dublin lads wouldn't have been coming in and seeing those kind of figures and you know, trying their best to impress these legends you know, that were going before them. All of a sudden, they're clear out of a dressing room. Your standards in training drop. Your standards then on the football fields drop. And I think it's more of that. I don't think that it's been a huge um, strategy shift or a way of doing things, a philosophy. I just think it's simply a panel that has grown old, shed all its sort of big leaders, and all of a sudden it just comes to a head and yeah, okay. the, you know, so, it's like mighty oak collapsing, really. Right, okay. So am I speaking for both of you? Are you, are you uh, Connor, first then, if Jim Gavin was still manager, Dublin don't win this South Ireland. Is that what you're both saying? I would think so. I would think so. And, you know, um, I would say that Jim Gavin, uh, who was always thinking a year or two ahead. Um, not that he kind of got out while the going was good, mm. but I think he probably saw that um, this stage of Dublin's evolution, that, that 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 was not really going to be the thing that he could influence as well as maybe somebody else coming in and having a different look at it. Um, so, no, like I wouldn't say any of the blame is, is on Desi Farrell. But just on that, that, that subject of the squad, like I remember after the 2017 All-Ireland final interviewing James McCarthy, and he spoke about... <laughs> the you know it's it, it's a cliched tale, but it was true that the A team had lost by a point to the B team the previous Saturday, yeah. and it, I, I did a bit of rooting around and I found out that the forward line for the A team, or for the B team, sorry, was Paul Flynn, Dermot Connolly, Kevin McManaman, uh, Bernard Brogan, Paddy Andrews, and somebody else ridiculous as well. <laughs> and I, I was only thinking the other day, like, what must the Dublin A versus B game have been like? last weekend you know because there's, there's no way yes Dublin still possess four or five of the best footballers probably ever but like like what are they coming up and you're just talking about like slight dipping standards like if that is your yeah if that is your sort of um your arena for preparation you know there's no doubt that they're not being pushed in the same way as they would have done before basketball was kind of made an example of within the Irish sporting community I mean, it would have been pointed out when the FAI ran into their crisis, the double standard, like n not that anybody would want our national soccer teams not to be playing, but it was raised that uh, that they got a bailout, whereas basketball was basically made an example of and where you had a situation where like, we had probably our greatest ever senior women's team at the moment on the verge of breaking into the top 12 in Europe. Like generational talent, Susan Moore and Michelle Fahey, and because of, again, like, you know, it would have only cost 50, 60 grand for that team to be competing. But basketball nearly would have been, uh, just felt it, it could, the, the, the governing body made the decision that, no, we, we can't even be seen. We have to be seen to suck it up. And, and, and a great players were lost. And Jason, it's fantastic. Like, Jason is a generational talent. Will go down as one of our best ever players. You know, only 20 in 2009. And having to struggle, you know, would, would he ever get to play again? Uh, for his country, 2015, 2016, we got back in. Uh, but to play at the stage that they belonged, and I suppose what, what would be governing is, as Jason said, look, it's not that Ireland won, it was the way they won, and they were so, mm. they were like, the, like they were high performers, you know, like you have talents like John Carroll, Jordan Blunt, CJ Fulton, Sean Flood, who deserve to be playing against better teams in Europe and that the country will watch, you know, the non-basketball public will watch because these are, are proper talents. And on the women's end, then you have, I suppose, we've had uh, uh, four or five exceptional players in the likes of Claire Amelia, Rachel Hodgins, Dana Finn, Sarka Turnan, who have won 
at the European B, B level, you know, beating the likes of Germany, Portugal, the UK, and um, you know they they started. They were the nucleus of the team that did so well out in Cyprus. And you know you can't. Uh, basketball has lost a lot of talents. Like you take people like Eva McDermott, who's you know starring now with the Irish national rugby team. Like Eva McDermott was a basketballer, she, but she's a high performer. And mm. you know if you had this level, she would probably still be playing basketball. But she was looking around. Was a European small country going to float her boat again? Mm. You know rugby did more for her. And I I think now the likes of those players that I mentioned will be more attracted to staying with the staying with basketball and with the Irish National Senior Programme. One thing I always, when I play against Lukaku from my own, my own personal experience when he was at Everton, um, is I always thought um, his biggest strength is, is running in behind so don't get caught in a foot race with him because you're going to lose that. Um, don't get too tight to him because he's stronger than you, you're going to lose that. Uh, I always kind of played in so far as get arms length away from him so he can't feel you. Uh, because invariably with him, his weakness is when the ball gets played into his feet, it, yeah. it's loose. It would squirt out the sides, it would bobble up, and, and, and when it did squirt out the side, even half a ball became visible, that's when you step in and toe poke it away from him. But if you get involved in a foot race with him, you're going to lose. If you get involved in a battle of strength with him, you're going to lose. So I always thought, don't, that was how I, I, you mm. know, I would judge playing against centre forwards, you know. Um, pick their weakest area and try and get the, the, the battle to that, if you know what I mean, the area where I could compete. Um, but with him, um, you know, he will keep centre backs away, absolutely. And all the number tens, the Mounts, the Kovacic's, the Pulisic, the you know, all those world class midfield players they have will have plenty of room to operate. And I think it's perfect. Okay. And also, I think um, on you know, he he loves getting himself on the penalty spot. He really does. Um, so uh, crosses are going to come in the box, and I think he's a perfect signing at the perfect time. Thinking about it afterwards, taking the the, the game out of it, come to the game in a second. Yeah. After, after Manchester City, for me, have lost a little bit of lust, like lost interest in them, um, in in a way that he spent a billion pounds, um, and when I say lost interest, I just I don't know, I I, I don't get excited by them. I, I just I'm just I, he spent a billion pounds, and they're a very very good team. Good luck to you lads, well done. You know you're probably going to win the Premier League this year, and there's no real um, soul to Manchester City. You know, like Liverpool have soul. The mm. manager has soul. You, you just love the energy, the, the 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 feeling that they play with, and I love watching that. With Manchester City, they're just clinical. Um, I've kind of there's not much emotion with City for sure. Yes, they're very well drilled. They're brilliant. They went and signed Jack Grealish. They're probably going to go and sign Harry Kane now because with that loss, Pep probably going to give the board an ultimatum. Um, and if I'm being honest with you, I've just lost. I, I don't want to lost my 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 luster for. I don't know. Mm. I just lost interest in them really I mean fair enough well done you're a good team um, whereas before I used to like watching Pep's teams but Saturday, uh, Sunday when they played I was just a little bit kind of watching them going nah, I could take your leave yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got no real feeling for towards you guys because you know the manager spent so much money and there's nothing wrong with that good luck to him but you know you look at what like Jurgen Klopp's going to have to do at Liverpool this year what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is going to have to do at Manchester United you know what Tuchel is doing at Chelsea I, I can buy into Chelsea I look at the manager and I'm like, oh, this is good. There's yeah, a verb, uh, yeah. an energy. I, I, I don't know if I'm explaining how I feel. No, I, to I you, you are. Yeah. You are, you are. The thing that Desi inherited, I think he was well aware of what he was getting himself into in terms of what was going to happen with the team, um, that it would break up. And his initial challenge was to keep as many of the elements together as possible, which he did. And you have to remember Dublin won the All-Ireland last year in Desi's first year without conceding a goal. So, um, you know, whatever dropping standards were there, they weren't there last year. Clearly, they weren't there last year. It was the easiest All-Ireland Dublin ever won. But I think, like, he's been unfortunate, Desi, in a lot of ways, because, um, you now, like, like all the other managers who took over in 2019 or 2020, that um, their preparation time has been affected. I think Desi, at this stage, would have liked to have moved this team on a small bit. But um, a couple of things went away against them. The first of which is that, you know, you have to ride the wave of what you have. And he inherited a team that had just won five All-Irelands in a row. So, you know, you weren't going to go around killing golden calves. Like, these were the proven winners. And, and whatever way that Desi wanted the team to play and whatever kind of players he wanted to pick, to me, was slightly limited in that. And then the other thing he had was two very fractured league campaigns with big sort of lockdown breaks in the middle of them. So 
In terms of cultivating new options, he didn't really get that chance. But on top of that, there is no doubt that the flow of talent that's coming from the underage ranks in Dublin is not quite as talented as it was before. The, un- the, the individuals are not quite as good. Like Jim Gavin always habitually every season shook up his team. He brought in somebody new. There was Paul Mannion, there was Brian Fenton, there was John Small, there was Brian Howard and all of those players made immediate impacts in year one. And I think Desi has given six championship debuts to players over the last two years and none of them were good enough to start on Saturday night. So I suppose it's a very long way of saying that he went back to the same players because they were tried and tested, but also because he didn't really have any other choice. Like you look at uh, Johnny Cooper there or John Small or Owen Merchant, they spent a lot of the season injured and there was no doubt that they were going to be put back onto the pitch when they got to the business end of the championship. Um, But equally, there was no doubt that they weren't quite at the peak of their ability. Under Jim Gavin, that might not have happened because they would have had better options there. Um, Their squad depth was an awful lot uh, better. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new 